All right. So today uh, we'll actually start writing some uh, parallel code. But before we do that, I think we should uh, do a little refresher on monads. Right? <laughs> Because you probably forgot. Well, I, I want to talk about this uh, um, the simplest possible monad, which is the identity monad. Okay. okay. So let, let me uh, define the identity functor identity of some type A. Okay. So identity is a type constructor here. It takes any type A and creates a value uh, using, um, well, let's call this constructor ID for simplicity, right? And this ID takes a value of type A. This so, is a data declaration. Yeah. Oh, yes, I should put data. <coughs> okay. So, um, this really does nothing, just encapsulates uh, some value of type A into this constructor and, and nothing else. Uh, and, to, and, and we can we can also extract this value A um, and we'll call this extraction function and we'll call it run identity. So right uh, Run identity takes uh, pattern matches to some x, right? ID of x. So pattern matches this constructor, extracts the x, right? And returns what? Something of type A, huh? Yes? X. <laughs> x, yes! Okay. So, so this is really stupid code, right? <laughs> Doesn't do anything. Um, but it, it so happens that even the simplest uh, thing is both a functor and a monad. So the functor thing, I, I'll leave you as an exercise. But let's let's do the monad. So instance instance monad. Identity. Right? This is a type constructor. Identity by itself is a type constructor. It requires a type to produce a type. Where? So what do we need? We need return. Return takes some x and uh, encapsulates it. Right? So there's nothing really to do. We'll just say ID X. So we are constructing the value of type identity A from some X. Trivial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Doesn't this require the type variable? This is monad identity A or by identity is uh, uh, should it be instance monad identity A where... No, identity A would give you uh, the type, and we want a type constructor for monad, right? Remember? Okay. It's abstracted over a type constructor. So this is something that still requires an argument. It's a star arrow star, right? Right? A kind of identity is this. Okay, so now we want to do. Um, I don't know what to write. Uh, Ix, maybe that will be like a, a monadic value of type identity A. Bind to some function f, right, the continuation. So we have an object of type identity a, and we want to bind it to a function. The function takes a 
and return some identity D. Right? So this is like a flies the arrow in this function. And how do we define this? Well, so we have to return identity, so we'll put ID here. So that's the constructor of the stuff. And, uh, and of course, we'll apply F to something. What should we apply it to? Well, we'll just do run identity on, the, on this I, IX, right? So we'll F applies to run identity of IX. So IX is, is, a, is a thing uh, of the type identity A, so run identity takes identity of X and returns an X, right? Wait, I, I so we, we can act with F on this. I thought F takes a... F takes A and returns identity B. And returns identity B. So why are we wrapping that in identity, in id? Oh. S thank you, thank you. Yes. No, no. <laughs> Over, kill. Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> I'm not great. Okay, so you understand this. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> okay, F returns identity. Yes. So, this is identity. Now, I want to show you the eval monad. So, uh, Simon doesn't really. Uh, show the definition, he just says, you know, import this from the library. But I will, I, will, I will show you the definition. What the heck? Why not? Right? So, uh, I don't know if I have space for this, but so, so data and uh, if I Right, so so he introduces the, this eval mode, eval of a equals, and he doesn't say that, but this is defined as the constructor is called done, and it takes a. Okay, so you see the similarity. Okay, so eval is sort of like the identity mode, right? So it has, uh, does it have run eval? Yeah, absolutely. Run eval, it takes done of A, and returns A, right? Well, done of X, I call it X. I can call it A if I want. Um, so that's identical, right? Now let's define the monad instance. So, um, instance monad, I will use this squeezed font because I'm good. <laughs> uh, instance monad eval, where? So return. <coughs> X is just equal to X. Right? So I'm just repeating this as changing ID to down. That's all I'm doing. Right? Okay, I, I can make some more room here if I if I copy and paste this. Move the camera back. Okay, and now we have to define bind. But let me do a little trick here, okay? Just it, It's really the same thing, right? I'm, I'm going to, instead of putting ix here, uh, I, I unpack it right here. Instead of run identity, I'll just unpack it here, okay? Everybody agrees that it's fine? equals fx. 
it's kind of simpler, right? I mean, it does the same, so that it, it, here it's unpacking it using run identity, and here it's unpacking it uh, using pattern matching. So it's not a simply constructed public. Yeah, yeah. So is it general that public except for IO? Well, okay, so the thing is that uh, this stuff is defined in a separate module, right? So the module can decide, you know, I want to export the constructor or not. And this, this module decides not to export the constructor. However, the, oh, the, the instance is defined in the same module. So in, inside that module, you can use uh, the constructor. Outside of this module, no. Okay? So is this exactly the same? Well, is there a difference? Is this like so operational? False the value. The unpacking. So okay, the pattern the, matching, right? So the pattern match false the Pattern matching forces the value. Yeah. Right. right. Whereas here it doesn't. It just creates what, what does it create? It creates a, a thumb that says, okay, eventually run identity when you unpack it. Right? When you force this, then, then you will run identity. And right, run identity does the unpacking, right? It does pattern matching. But there is something in between the pattern matching and, and this. It's a function. So, so this postpones the unpacking. This eagerly unpacks it. Okay? So this is a difference between this is called a strict monad when the argument to bind, the first argument to bind, is forced. This is non-strict mode, because the argument is not forced. It actually appears still thunked. Okay? So, that doesn't seem like a huge difference, but, uh, but these are two different monads, really. Semantically, they are the same. But operationally, something happens, right? So this, this makes a difference, for instance, if x is divergent, if x is calculated from some you know, infinite loop, or if x throws an exception, runtime exception, then these two are different, okay? So the eval monad is exactly like the identity monad, except it's forced. It's strict. Okay? So now I can forget about the identity monad. This is just an interesting thing to know. So in practice, like, how does that affect like, your choice? Well, in practice, um, space. The, the, the difference is that in many cases we don't want to start the evaluation too early, right? It's like if you start the evaluation and, and you have something that's divergent, you'll hit this divergence. But you don't know, maybe you don't need to evaluate this stuff, right? Like if you have a pair of you know, things that the first expression diverges and the second doesn't. Canceling infinities. And, and you say, uh, you know, give me second. <coughs> then you don't ever evaluate the first, right? But if you do pattern match, you know, and, and you extract it, then you force it. So, now, so, so this is uh, run eval is necessary. So this is exported from this module, and we'll be using it. So this is something that just takes this uh, eval <coughs> object and extracts the value from it. So this is like getting out of the monad, does that. Um, but then, because this is used in, in parallelism, then we have two additional functions 
defined for the, for the eval monad. They are outside of the definition of a monad, but they are um, necessary. So there is a function called rpar. And it's of the type A eval A. And there is a function RC, which is also of the same type, A eval A. However, they do different things. So this one takes a, an expression of type A and says, I'm going to run this expression in parallel. Okay. So, so if you remember from the previous um, presentation, this starts a spark. So this is something that, that creates a spark for A. And it will be executed in parallel if there are additional processes. They steal the spark. RC, on the other hand, says, uh, before you return, evaluate A4. Okay? So it was very similar to seek. Now, seek is actually a very tricky function. Did, it, did I talk about this? A little bit in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So seek does not guarantee that the second thing will not be evaluated before the first thing. Now this one does. Okay. Now why is this returning eval A? That's a very good question. And it's a very deep question actually. Because originally uh, the first implementation of this was returning a unit. It's just, okay, so I spark this stuff, and what do I do with it? I, I return a unit. It's just an operation that's, that sort of uh, has a side effect of sparking something. It doesn't have to return anything, right? So this is like, but later I'll, sh I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, not maybe not the whole story, about why we actually use the eval monad to encapsulate this instead of just returning units. It's like a uniqueness typing thing. Is every eval? No, actually, is actually, it has something eval. to do with uh, garbage collection. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you wouldn't think about it, right? <laughs> but it does. Yeah. Okay. So the important thing about this is that the evaluation of these things is done to weak head normal form, okay? So it just evaluates the top of the expression. Like if it's a data, it will just evaluate the construct. We'll find out how it was constructed from something, right? And this something will still remain as a thunk. It will not be evaluated. Um, and this, this actually turns out to be um, like more basic then deeply evaluate. So if, if you create these primitives that do shallow evaluation, right, then it's easy later to do deep evaluation uh, rather than the other way around. From deep evaluation, you kind of can't get back shallow evaluation. So now, how is this used in practice? So let me write a, a little uh, program that uh, calculates the value of a function f, let's say this function f takes a long time, on two different um, arguments. So f of x and f of y, right? It, it might return different results, right? And, and uh, the execution of function f might take long. <coughs> so we will say, OK, <coughs> do in parallel r bar fx and, and also do in parallel fy. Okay. 
Okay? Now this thing, R par, returns an eval of A. So the result of this in do notation, so we have to put do here somewhere. Do. We are in, in the do block because we are doing monadic uh, calculation. Right? So R par will return some X prime. Okay? So in reality it returns a file of X prime. But under do, we write it as if it were returning X prime. And R bar of Fy will return some Y prime. Okay? So now that we have both of these guys, we can say, okay, then return a pair, x prime, y prime, okay? And in order to get this, this pair, okay, return will put this inside the eval monad, right? So the whole result will be an eval of a, pop, of a pair, right? So we have to run eval on top of this. Run eval will extract the value of this pair from the monadic value. Okay? So we got inside the monad using do, we do monadic calculation, and then we extract back to normal world, non-monadic world, by, by doing run eval. So, what, when this program is executed, and, and this pair forced by, let's say, printing it, right? Then uh, what happens is a spark is started for fx, a spark is started for fy, and they maybe will start executing in the background if some other processor steals it, right? So the diagram for how this thing runs is, and let's suppose that uh, the first one takes longer, right? So the evaluation of fx takes longer. It starts here and just goes on. The evaluation of Fy, let's suppose it's short. Now, when the return happens, the return happens right here. Because all what it does is start a spark, start a spark, return. So the execution of this stuff is just like start, start, return. Okay? And then, this stuff can go on in the background. We don't have to force it yet. Only when we start to print this pair, okay, then we force it. By, but but this, by this time, maybe they are already evaluated. Right? And we gain some parallels. Now, there are other possibilities of doing this. Um, For instance, we can say R seek here. If we do R seek here, then this will spark, Fx will be sparked, but Fy will be evaluated at this point, right? So return will only happen after Fy is evaluated. So in this case, return happens here. Okay, so that's the return. Yeah, is that clear? I mean, fx can be going on, you know, it can be going on a long, long time, right? But as soon as fy uh, finishes evaluation, then we can uh, execute return, this function return. So RC says, do this, actually do this on my processor, right? This can be stolen because it goes into a spark pool. This will be executed on the same processor. So these two are sequenced. First, this will have to finish, and then return will be executed, okay? Uh, there, are, there are more possibilities. Uh, we can do R par, R par, 
And before we return, so let me erase this, copy and paste. Uh, and we can say, um, RC x prime, RC y prime, and then we turn. Okay, so we start these two in parallel, but then we wait on, on this same processor we'll be executing the value of x prime and y prime. So we have to wait. Our seek says, wait until we are finished getting x prime. And this will block waiting for this guy to finish. And this will block then waiting for this guy to finish. So return will happen really here. After both of them finished. Okay? There is still parallelism in this, right? These two guys will go in parallel. They will be probably stolen by some other processor. Or two processors. They may be. Maybe not. We never know. This is just a hint for the, for the runtime to say, if you can, please evaluate it in parallel. But there is no guarantee. So, now, um, the second example in the book is uh, more complicated, okay? and, but also more uh, interesting. It actually does something. So the second example is of the Sudoku solver. So let me leave this stuff. R R. <coughs> this we don't really see because this is hidden in the file that we are importing, the module that we are importing. We don't see the definition either. So it's just uh, something we believe. Um, so, so, um, so he doesn't show the, the Sudoku solver it, itself. And, I mean, there, there is just a uh, function called solve that given a Sudoku puzzle, I think everybody knows what this what Sudoku is, right? Okay, uh, it, it, it returns um, a maybe. Why? Because not all Sudoku puzzles have a solution, right? So it will return nothing if there is no solution, and it will return just solution if there is solution. So, so there is this a function solved. And it takes a puzzle, which is actually a string, and returns maybe. I hope this is maybe great. Yeah. I have to talk about that for you. Maybe solution. Which solution is also a string. Okay. So, given this, that we have this, um, there, the program starts with a bunch of imports. So it's like in C++ or C, you have include, and right, that includes the header file. Uh, in Haskell, you have this import. So you say import and you give it the qualified module name. Module names are, are things uh, with dots in between names. Right? So you have a bunch of things. Like you import Sudoku, you import, what is it? Control, Control exception. exception. I'm not really sure for what it was used. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of these imports might not be. System environment is just to get the command line argument, and and data maybe is to get uh, the function is just. 
Okay, so let me write the main function then. And I can be looking there or I can be <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can okay. get rid of that. So, so, so the main <laughs> function is a do, right? Uh, what in what monad? What does this do? I.O. I.O. Right, because main always has the type I.O. So we are inside the I.O. mode. And you can do a bunch of stuff inside the I.O. mode. Okay, so um, first we, we call this function get arms. Get arms. And this is an, also a function that uh, well, it's not really a function. It's a function of no arguments, right? Yes? I just had a question. It might be not like the right timing, but maybe there's going to be a better timing. So like, here we are in the I.O. monad, and we can use do notation with the arrows to do like I.O. operations. But then sometimes, maybe it's also a monad, right? And you can do, you could use do notation with maybe, mm -hmm. and extract just and all that. But you can't like mix and match them. How is it possible? Oh, mixing and matching, like combining two monads. Yeah, that's done by uh, monad transformers. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's a little bit messy stuff. Okay, so I'm just wondering if there's ever a good time to get into that. I was just curious. <laughs> like, I would love to use like the do notation for IO, and then in the middle of it, I would like to extract something from a maybe without doing ah. a case and get that whole. Ah, I see. If there's ever like a good time. No, no, I mean. It, in, when, when you are writing parsers, for instance, then, then you have like, first of all, they may return maybe, uh, second of all, they are processing a string, so it's a, it's a list monad, it's a maybe monad, or either monad, um, yeah. and actually, instead of, e of either monad, you actually use the list monad sometimes, and, and so on. So, there is a combination of a few monads there. They use like MTLs at the last Yeah, MONAD yeah. transforms. Something yeah. I might find like is using explicit binds in fact is easier than <laughs> so, so, answer. So get args is a, is a well, it's a nullary function. It doesn't take any arguments. But it returns IO of an array of arguments. So like if you call your, your, your program with a bunch of arguments, this thing returns an array of arguments. Let's call them f, right? So under do, I'm just saying get args returns an array of f's. In reality, it returns an I/O of this array, right? But I'm inside do, so I can write this. You return an I/O of a map, right? It's, a, it's an array of strings. No, it's just a bunch of strings. strings. It's just a bunch of strings, nothing else. Okay. It's just an array of strings. Um, then we have to, so, so th this is of course a demo program, so it does not deal with errors and so on. So it, we just assume that this is a singleton uh, list, okay? It's a singleton list. It contains only one element f, okay? Yeah, if somebody calls with two arguments, then the program blows up. That's a pattern match. Yes. Did you make that? Is that obvious to everyone? Yeah. So, so we assume that get args returns IO that contains just a single element uh, list. Right? So this is a single element list. Doesn't do pattern matching on empty list, doesn't do pattern matching on, you know, big tail. No, just this. So it's a, it's an incomplete map. What, what happens if, it, if you pass an event to the store with more? You'll get an incomplete Well, the, the, the program will blow up. Okay. It's equivalent. Yeah. These is to a case statement. Yeah. Just one case, which would be the brackets F. Single with a kind of And if there that, isn't, so. uh, yeah, it'll fall through and you'll get out of it. And then we read this file. Okay, so we'll pass the file name. The file name is supposed to be this, this one and only argument that we are passing to our program. Right? So we do read file, and the read file again takes a string, right? The file name, pass, and uh, it returns an I/O, obviously, right? Because it's an I/O operation. Um, 
that we'll call file. It, it really returns a long string. Right? Just reads the whole file and returns this big long string. Of course, it does it lazily. So it doesn't really return this huge string. Okay? This is lazy I am. So don't worry. It won't just not stop and, and you know read the whole file and only then proceed. Okay, and now inside this do block we can do a few lets. Okay? Like define some um, local names for things that are pure. Okay, so we can do some pure uh, computation. So let's give the name puzzles to the application of the function lines to five. Right. Okay, so this is a pure function now. We are not in, in the IO monad. We are just inside this let statement. So we do pure stuff. Uh, lines is a function that takes one huge string and splits it on the boundaries of new lines. Right? So it turns the whole file into, into lines. That's why it's called lines. They're very useful. Thing. So it returns puzzles, which it, because there is one puzzle per line in this file, we're assuming. Okay? No error checking, nothing. Just Go blindly. So here are here's an array of strings, and these strings represent the puzzles. Now I mean they are encoded like as what is it? How many numbers? Yeah, it was eighty one. Yeah. Plus some gaps. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Plus, uh, I think they, they use an uh, asterisk for uh, unfilled or, or minus sign. It doesn't matter. So there is some symbol. OK. So we have puzzles. And this is pure computation. Uh, <coughs> inside the say, same let, we can define more variables or names. Um, Solutions, you can say solutions. How do we get solutions? Well, we have we have the solve um, function, right? So we, we want to apply the solve function, but we want to apply it to a whole array of puzzles, right? So we'll do map. So let's just map solve on puzzles. Right? So this works on a single puzzle, but puzzles is an array of, of uh, puzzles. So mapping solve on puzzles will return an array of solutions. These solutions are, of course, the maybes. Okay? Now what do we want to do? Oh, and by the way, let statements inside the do block, they just become statements. Uh, they don't need the in. Okay? So this is why when you are in, um, in GCHI, GHCI, if you are in GHCI, uh, you can actually type in let something equal something, let something else equal something. You never put in there because you are inside the IO mode. Okay? When you are GHC, when you are using GHCI, you are inside an IO. So you don't end your LEDs with in. It's just statements. Okay? So finally we want to print. Okay, what do we want to print? We don't want to print all the solutions. They will take forever. Okay? Because how many puzzles they have in this file? 10,000 10, puzzles or 1,000? Uh, 1,016,000, I believe. 1,000 puzzles? Yeah. Okay, so it's 1,000 puzzles. If we printed all these solutions, it would take forever. 1,016,000, 49,000, 
some data sets. Ah, they, they have bigger ones too. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so we'll just, we just want to print the number of solutions, which will, but we want to force the program to evaluate these solutions. So how can we force it to evaluate the solutions? Okay, and that's a, that's a very clever thing. Let me write it down and then I'll explain. So dollar sign, print, dollar sign, length, length of an array, right? Another dollar sign. And now we do filter is just Solutions. Okay, so the function filter, it's a very good function, very <coughs> useful function. Filter takes an array, uh, I mean a list, sorry, takes a list and, uh, and, and a predicate. The predicate is something that, it's a function that returns a boolean. Yes or no, yes or true, false, true, false, true, false, right? So it's just, it's, that's, that's a function from this data maybe. Uh, it just takes a maybe value and returns true if it's just and false when it's nothing. So it just tests, is there something or nothing, right? So it's a good predicate. So we apply this predicate to the list of solutions and filter will just skip all these things that don't satisfy the predicate, right? So it will skip all these uh, puzzles that don't have a solution. In this case, actually all of them have solutions, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that in order to find if it's just or nothing, the program has to actually solve it, right? Without solving the puzzle, it cannot say whether it's just or not, right? whether there is a solution or not. So in this way, you are forcing the, the, the solution of every puzzle, but you are not really looking at the solution. What you are doing is, is you are looking whether it's solvable or not. Yeah? I mean, it works, but it's so implicit. I mean, how... Back to write only languages. <laughs> no, this is, this is a very common pattern in, in Haskell. I mean, you are seeing it the first time, so it's kind of it's weird. Force evaluation by mapping the predicate. Is well, I guess what you do I mean, is, is you first try say, okay, so let me just print all the solutions. And then you see, okay, that's too much. No, I don't want to print all the solutions. Then you say, okay, so maybe I just want to print the length of the list. But the length of the list is just calculated by, you know, going through the spine of the list. Yeah, so it's a clever problem. It's does, a clever does solution, but... So, I think a way to justify it, <laughs> <laughs> and you might consider this to be the, an obnoxious uh, joke around or just playing with semantics, but. The thing about Haskell, in general, it's a language that only does as much work as you need it to. And if it ought to evaluate the length of that list, you don't need to evaluate all. It will do it very, list. very quickly. No, I, I understand. So, so Richard is a, is a hacker genius. Bartlett no. is a hacker genius. But I come across this code on GitHub. How am I supposed to read this? Well, yes, yeah, but th that's the thing. You have to think about how much of the objects containing the Sudoku puzzle needs to be evaluated in order to compute the length of the list. Well, none of it. But in order to compute the, whether it's a valid solution or not, well, you have to compute all of it. So, yeah, okay, it's a trick. But, I mean, uh, that was very smart, Richard. You know, I'll hire you, but I can't read the code. <laughs> so, this is just a common pattern in Haskell. This is how you do this stuff, you know? And um, once you learn it, you know. I mean, would it be more explicit to say it's map deep seek 
of uh, solutions. Would that have the same effect, or would that be different? Well, you, uh, you, you specifically yeah. Deep sea yeah, yeah, deep sea. There. But we haven't introduced deep sea yet. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you could you could just force full evaluation, and they just say, give me the length so of the list. Because you want to print something, right? You don't want to print too much. You want to print some number. So if you don't print anything, well, then your program will not run at all. Okay, so now we understand this program, okay? Uh, notice, there's no parallelism here yet. This is sequential solution, okay? We'll be parallelizing it. So, I mean, we can run this, this, this demo, right? Yes, do it. You have, you have a little batch file, uh, yeah. shell script, just that. Okay. This will run it with the uh, runtime stats, but that's okay. I'll tell you what the command line is running, so I'm just... So it's compiling. Yeah, let me scroll up. You can see Running. everything that uh, just around there. So that line at the top starts plus stack. That's that's the command line you run to compile it. So that's just sort of saying let's pull it to type in GHC, you know, compiler with a bunch of hard in your HI which are Haskell interface files. And output and then minus O is output to dot out slash Sudoku one. So that's the name of the executable, the binary being executed by this command line. Minus O2 is the optimization level, which is, I think that's the highest. Minus RTS ops, minus threaded. Uh, so the first one, minus RTS ops, is compile with the runtime statistics uh, enabled. So you can get the GC numbers, which we'll see in a second. Minus threaded is compiled as a multi threaded executable. And then use uh, those two source files. So lib slash sudoku.hs is the, the Sudoku solver, which we're just treating as a black box for the purposes of this class. Um, and then sudoku1.hs is that program that uh, Bartosz drew, drew on the, wrote on the board there. And so that's compiling it, and then the next uh, three lines down it says plus stack exec. That's how you run, that's running the execute call. You know, dot out slash sudoku1, passing in puzzle slash sudoku17, 1000.txt, which is just a text file containing a thousand sample sudoku puzzles. And then the plus RTS minus N2 minus S at the end is just sort of saying dump out the runtime statistics at the end. N2 is says run on two cores, minus S is generate statistics. So there are options for the RTS uh, runtime. But it's statistics. a single threaded execution. Well, in this case, I'm, I'm saying, uh, yeah, threads. run on two cores. It's only going to run on one core if it's a single threaded program, but this it's could potentially use two cores. So what is the most important number here? Uh, the elapsed time. The, the elapsed time, which I will scroll down to. So here you see this group of five times, uh, timings, and the one that we care about the most is total time, elapsed time, that, that bottom row. And elapsed time is the, uh, that is kind of like the clock time. That's what the user perceived time of the execution of the program. So it's more or less 1.2, 1 1.3? Yes, 1.2. One point Three seconds, right? The 1.565 in the column immediately before that is the total CPU time. And you'll see that's typically, that's always going to be slightly higher. And it's, but it's a single threaded program, so there's some overhead. There's 300 milliseconds of overhead to do with things like a garbage collector. This is running, okay. probably running on the call. But. So I, I wrote down this uh, 1.3 seconds, yeah. or is it 1.25? 1.25. Let's say 1.5. One and a quarter seconds. Yeah, one and a quarter seconds. Because we will compare it later to the runtime of the improved program, the parallel program. And hopefully, parallel will run fast. I've, I've gathered data for all the other programs. Okay. So, can pop so let's take a break now.